So, hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Schabowski. I'm a senior architect in the office of the CTO, and I'm joined here with Mark D. Pasquale, a developer advocate for Solace. So the purpose of our discussion today is really to talk about um, event-driven and, and ultimately the need for event management, and ultimately how we're keying in on sort of the way that API management works and how we're um, using those same sort of tenants from an API and event management perspective at Solace. So ultimately, a big part of this talk is also to explain sort of what do we mean by event-driven. Um, event-driven is certainly a technical thing, but it can also be a, a very personal thing and a business thing. And so ultimately, the point also can be that our lives are really event-driven. And so from my own perspective of traveling to California in order to do this uh, presentation, of course, I swipe my credit card along the way, and that ultimately is an event onto itself. But then the question is, is really how do you, from a business perspective, key into those events and what are the things that you need to do um, as part of that event? Um, so of course, the very first thing you might do is, is check to see if I have available credit. Luckily, I do, so that was good. Um, <laughs> but that event can mean a lot more things to the business. I think everyone these days is doing things like fraud detection, um, and they're doing it in real time in order to get that end answer back, but also, some of our customers are doing things like, as you swipe, maybe doing an in-store offer. Um, so one of the big banks has a thing with uh, Best Buy, and so when you swipe, if you have points available, you could actually pay for that purchase with your points versus actually with your credit card. So another example is your flight's delayed. Uh, luckily, uh, the weather was good here in San Francisco, so I didn't have a problem getting in, but if I had, uh, my airline certainly would have taken that event that maybe came from the FAA uh, and notified the passengers, such as myself, of the impending delay. But what else can we do with that event? Um, well, I would hope my airline would rebook uh, the connections, maybe in order of your loyalty and priority, um, but also, you know, notify partners' hotels. You know, I'm staying here at a Marriott. They're a partner of the airline I flew in on. So how about instead of me having to call the hotel saying, you know, I'm gonna show up at 2 a.m., you just notify the hotel and maybe the hotel does something nice for me as well. A hotel key card is used in an elevator, so the hotel we're staying at down the road, you basically have to, you know, just to get to your room, you have to, to tap your card. So that's another type of, a, of an event. Um, so what could you do with that? Of course, validate that I am allowed to go to that floor, but maybe give an offer uh, for the bar. Maybe I was there last night, which I was, um, and maybe <laughs> if you gave me a two-for-one offer, instead of going back to my room, I would actually have another drink, spend some more money, and maybe some personalization. You know, traveling for business all the time kind of sucks, but maybe a nice message targeted directly towards me increases my brand awareness and ultimately my desire to stay at that hotel chain. Last but not least from an example perspective, because hopefully you're getting the idea here, is that maybe a larger than normal checks deposit. I wish this was the case um, for myself. Uh, that's an event that a bank would get. Of course, um, the very first thing that you want to do is of course update the balance in my, my account so I can start to use that money, but now that I have more money, maybe increase my credit limit, right? So I spend more money. And I actually saw an interesting study that says any time that you kind of get a job increase, the number of times that you buy a vehicle right around that time is, is, is almost a given. Um, and so because of that, maybe offer me a new auto loan rate so that I'm incentivized to start to spend some of that money from a banking perspective. So the point here being that really our lives are event driven. And organizations themselves want to be event driven, but why is it really that we all aren't event-driven? I think that's a good question. And I think from my perspective of being a customer previously of Solace and having to build out an event-driven architecture for the FAA, that the developer experience is really poor, right? Um, a lot of the organizations that have been very successful with being event-driven, they've had to invest a lot of resources and time and effort in order to develop the expertise in-house in order to really um, make this transition to being event-driven. Things like AMQP APIs aren't exactly beautiful and MQTT and, and PAHO, like these are things that aren't as easy to use as REST APIs and so you kind of really have to want to be event-driven and I think that's, that's sad. Um, the other aspect being the lack of manageability and sort of cause, you know, in, in governance really and the issues that they cause. So imagine you're 10 years ago like myself and you're tasked with how do you do air traffic management and providing all of this information to airlines uh, in real time from an FAA perspective and you realize the weather domain just of itself has 
um, over 20,000 individual events, different sensors at different airports, different triggers, all of these different things. How do you discover 20,000 different things? How do you figure out what you actually want to consume and the types of insights you could get by consuming these events? That's sort of the lack of manageability and the lack of governance that we're really talking about. And it really creates this, the wild, wild west of events. Um, and so ultimately, you have to figure out how to tame that. And in, but in spite of these challenges, we from a company are supporting a lot of companies successfully, but it tends to be within different enclaves. So for instance, at RBC, their, their uh, low latency trading platform does 60 billion transactions across us a day. Um, are they successful within capital markets? Absolutely. Have they really become an event-driven organization across the entire bank? Not exactly. Uh, Nets Pay in Singapore is another one of our customers. And really what they were looking to provide is an easier customer payment experience and ultimately giving the banks much more information about the customer journey as they were going and buying different products within Singapore. Are they successful? Absolutely. But has it, are they truly an event-driven organization? They're getting there. Finally, Airtel, um, I think they're one of the largest telcos in India, they were able to decrease the time in which it takes to provision a phone from a large number of minutes down to seconds by being event driven and ultimately we do 90 billion transactions a day with them. But how do we fix this such that it's not just sort of a niche environment, a large bank, a large telco that's able to participate in being event driven? So because our perspective is, is that APIs aren't going anywhere, they're awesome for commands, they're awesome for queries, but there is this category of events. And to be real time and event driven is ultimately what a lot of customers and organizations are trying to do. So first, what we need to be able to do is manage events. And so what ultimately we're talking about is we need answers to the who, what, when, where, why, how of events. Um, you know, where do I go to discover events? What are the events that are available from a catalog perspective of, of things I can consume? Um, how do I specify the asynchronous application interfaces of the application so that I can even do things like total lifecycle management, when are events available or going to be deprecated, et cetera? And how do you do things even from a developer perspective, like maybe generate code like you're able to do with OpenAPI uh, and Swagger? But also, I think it's important to recognize, and I think this is something that we, from a Sol's perspective, have realized is, you know, really API management has solved a lot of the who, what, when, where, why, how of events. You know, there's API gateways, and that's the runtime asset that's generally proxying these APIs. Um, but there's also this thing called an API portal, which a lot of you, of course, have used. And that's where you do your documentation that enables uh, discovery. It's where you do your uh, registration and, and, and helps you govern, ultimately, your um, API ecosystem. You can do analysis to know sort of what are the most used services, least used services, et cetera, even the performance of your services. And finally, be able to communicate and collaborate around the APIs that are in your organization. But what about the event side, right? Um, we, from our perspective, have been providing event brokers to the market for a decade and stitching them in to get together from a dynamic federation perspective into something we call a dynamic event mesh, where we connect sources and syncs all across the world to exchange information in real time, doing all of the things that we all know and care about, like security and persistence, all of the different qualities of service. But we've completely ignored and the industry has completely ignored the design, development, and management time from an event-driven API perspective. So what we're looking to be able to do is do the exact same types of things that you did with API management solutions, but tailored towards the event-driven asynchronous domain to really allow developers and architects a much better experience in, in really being able to embrace being event-driven. So thirdly, we need to be able to model our event-driven enterprises and our event-driven landscape. And so to do that, there are a couple of elements and foundational elements that we have to keep track of. So the very first is imagine a world where you have an event portal and you can define application domains. And application domains are just ways in which to organize your enterprise. Maybe there are lines of business within a bank. Maybe it's wealth management versus securities. Um, but then within those different domains, there are, of course, payload schemas. You know, there are XML schemas, Avro schemas, JSON schemas. But then it's time to define the event. And an event is ultimately, it's got that payload, so it's referenced. But it also has business context. Um, 
you know, when, when working with the FAA, it's funny that, you know, there's a lot of schemas, but in one particular case, airlines were very confused by, there's three different events, they all look the same, but they all have actually a different field. And the airlines were going, what do I do with this? That's what we're talking about when it comes to context. Being able to provide business context to events. And then finally, defining your application. What is your application's asynchronous interface? What are you consuming and what are you producing? And once you have this model, and this is ultimately what we are building at Solace, then you're able to track all of these relationships. And what those relationships mean is maybe I'm an application and I'm producing an event. And someone else is consuming that event, doing something else and producing a new event. And it goes on and on and on. That ultimately is what we call event-driven application choreography. And so the ability to view that completely across the enterprise by use case is something that's really needed in order to do change analysis and in order to truly embrace being event-driven. And four, and I would say just as importantly as any of the numbers before is we need a machine readable application spec. And luckily, Fran Mendez, Fran, maybe stand up, come on. <laughs> hey, round of applause for Fran. Um, he's helping bring to market a machine readable application spec called Async API. And so Solace is a proud contributor to the Async API spec. Uh, you know, we help review the specification with Fran but we're also looking to be building code generators to help the development experience, which is certainly what Mark's about to, to show us here. And so ultimately, for those who have missed any of Fran's talks since he's been here, you know, here's a quick example. Mark will show one as well, directly applicable to the use case we're gonna do, which is you, know, you have these things called channels and Solace World, those relate to topics and you know, they define down you know, what is the action you're gonna do, publish or subscribe, and then finally, the message definition, which is going to come in uh, or, or out of that channel. And so enough talking from me. Um, Mark, it's, it's time to sort of do a demo of what we're bringing to market this fall. Um, obviously there's a warning here of, you know, it's a live demo, so things are bound to go wrong. Um, so Mark, yeah, over thanks. to you. Thanks for that uh, great mojo there with your warning sign. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so hopefully this will show up. Nope, of course. Off to a great start here. See if we can mirror the display instead. We're not panicking yet. No, nope, here we go. All right, so as Jonathan was mentioning earlier, we're building a event portal. So this is a preview of that and we're hoping to release it later this fall. So from an architect's perspective, you know, we really want to allow you to design and visualize um, your event-driven architectures. Um, so this is kind of the home screen right now, and we have the different application domains that, that Jonathan mentioned. Um, so this could be different lines of business, um, different software engineering groups, different, different projects, whatever, whatever makes sense uh, for your organization. You can also see different schemas or domains, or sorry, events that traverse those application domains. So for this demo, I'm gonna go ahead and use our tweet analytics um, application domain. And good, still on the internet, okay, great. Um, so as part of this, we're just gonna build, we had a, basically a requirement, say, for marketing, and they're taking in a stream of tweets from Twitter about an organization, and as we all know, it's, it's not polite to yell on Twitter with all caps, so we're just gonna take the capital letters, change them to lowercase, and make the, the tweets polite. Um, so as part of that, we can see we have, we have one schema, two events, and three applications as part of the application domain. So we've got a tweet source um, application here. And the, so the tweet source application sends an inbound tweet that's received by our no yelling processor. And then that is gonna produce a no yelling tweet, so now our polite tweet, which throws it into our Elasticsearch, um, basically data store using a, uh, the RESTful interface on Elasticsearch. So let's go ahead and look at our schema. So as we'd expect, we have a, a tweet schema. So what the portal allows you to do is define kind of your business object schema or your payload schema. So we have a schema name and versioning, so you can version. I mean, obviously your business has to, you know, your business will change and events will change. Um, the share schema button here allows you to share your events across application domains. So in this case, this application domain was for like a marketing department, but I'm sure like the sales department would also like to receive tweet events and potentially, you know, if, if somebody's out there trying to buy the product, I'm sure the sales team will jump right on that. You can also define your events and of course, uh, 
use a, a schema to do so. So in this case, for the preview, we've got a JSON schema in here, but as Jonathan mentioned earlier, when we release later this fall, we expect to support Avro schema and XML schema as well, and, and more to, to follow that. All right, so let's go ahead and look at one of the applications. So if I look at the no yelling processor here, from an application perspective, again, of course, you can name and version your application, but you can also choose one or multiple events that are produced from the application and also consumed. Um, so these are, these are the events from an event-driven perspective, right, that are come into our application and the ones that get sent out um, after our processing is, processing is complete. We can define a language that we want to build our application in, a wireline protocol, so in this case, it's solves message format, but it could be MQTT, AMQP, you know, any, any protocol uh, of your choice, and an API. So in this case, we're using uh, Spring Cloud Streams. So Spring Cloud Streams is basically one of the Spring projects that allows you to build kind of highly scalable, event-driven uh, microservices. And then, so, so at this point, we can kind of see how we can define our events, how we can define our schemas, how we can connect them together. And um, I guess just to show, we saw the visualization here, so this is a, obviously a graph visualization of how they connect up, but we'll be adding visualizations to that as well. So this is great from an architect's perspective, but now for a developer, I really wanna make development easier. So say I was developing that no yelling processor application that we were just looking at. So let me click on it here. So what I can actually do is export an async API spec that Jonathan mentioned. And I can choose the, the Solace Cloud Service or the event broker that I want to run that against. So I'm just going to go ahead and download a async API spec 2.0. So I want to use the latest. And then let's go ahead and look at what that looks like. So if I go to Sublime, open recent. So that downloaded here to a no yelling processor.yaml file. And so in here, I can see the different components of my application. So this specification, this async API specification defines my application, the no yelling application. So I've got different components here. So the schemas, we can see our tweet object. And as we scroll down, it's got all the different fields that are expected in that object. Um, the messages, so we've got inbound tweets is the uh, message that's received. And then the no yelling tweet is the message that is produced. The channels that those event events are sent and received on. Um, of course, our async API version and some more information here, including the servers that I can connect to send or receive um, those events. So that's great. So now I have a specification that defines what I want to do, but from a developer perspective, I actually want to generate code. So let me copy this. So, so Solace created a async API Spring Cloud Streams generator. And so what that does is it takes in the async API file. Can you guys read that? Let me make it a little bit bigger. So it takes in a async API file and a username and password to connect to the broker and essentially generates an app. So at the bottom here, it says where my project has been generated. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over to the IDE since it's a little bit easier to see here. And if I import, it generates a Maven project, so I'm gonna import it as a Maven project from my initializer directory, and there we go, okay, awesome. All right, so if you've ever, if you're a Java developer, this setup will look normal to you. I've got my source main Java um, folder where my you know, main classes are, I've got a test directory, et cetera. And so under types, it actually generated the tweet pojo and all the fields that belong to a tweet, so the user that, that tweeted it, the text, hashtags, et cetera. And we've got a red X here, which is obviously not good. So we, but um, essentially here, we've got the no yelling processor application. So this is the application that the developer actually has to build. And the reason we have the red X is basically we need to add our business logic. So in this case, um, like any good demo, I've got that sitting right over here. All right. So, very simple, we're just gonna log that we, re we received a tweet, change all the lowercase, uh, uh, all the uppercase letters to lowercase, and then return that tweet. And so through the power of uh, Spring Cloud Streams, 
it abstracts all the messaging. So I just say, hey, I want to receive from the input channel. I want to send to the output channel, and that's all defined by the code generator, and it's in a configuration file, essentially. So all the developer had to do was add his business logic, and now I can run that as, as a Spring Boot app, and Spring Cloud Streams is based on Spring Boot. So the application will, will start up, and there we go. It's receiving tweets. So you can see, essentially, through the event portal, by using an as async API specification and using code generation, it really makes building event-driven applications easy and simple for the developer. And so we plan on working with Fran and the Async API initiative to continue to provide you know, more and more code generators for things beyond Spring Cloud Streams and, and making this easier for, for all of you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So I guess my question is, uh, does anyone have any questions before we uh, sort of wrap up this talk? Sure. Yeah, so I think that's a really great question. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah. yeah, so the question was is sort of when should I use an event-driven architecture versus when should I use an API or synchronous-based um, based, uh, architecture? So I think that's a really good question. I, I, I sort of um, said before, you know, things where you're doing um, commands and queries are obviously great for APIs. I think when you really start to think about state changes, uh, change events, maybe something is coming in, maybe a new user signing up, that might be a command that you're taking in from an API perspective, but that's also can be an event to anything else in the system. And so I think when you start to think about sort of the different state changes that can occur within your applications and within your systems, those are all great candidates to make available as events. And once you've made it available as an event, then any number of things in the future could receive it. So for instance, doing the fraud detection, is this person a real person or not? Um, being able to provide um, predictive analytics or machine learning can now just hang off and ultimately your experience from an end user perspective can still be API driven at the front end, but then within your system uh, demarcation, in a lot of cases that's a great uh, use case for being event driven. Does that help? Sure, but the, the problem that we find typically is that those services end up being point to point. And so as you're then wanting to add more and more capabilities, so for instance, you wanna then have that go into a downstream, you know, AI machine learning type of a system, or you want it to go to a different cloud to take advantage of another service, you're having to now do sort of point to point integration over and over again with that event versus just being able to use an event broker, produce that event once, and then basically decouple the rest of your system from what happens and who else wants to consume that event. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've got time for one more question, probably. Uh, thank you. I, I want to go to the basic because I don't understand everything. Can you give us the definition of what is an event? Boy, that is that is the loaded question of the hour. Um, so I think there's 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 a multitude of definitions of what an event is. Um, most organizations use events for any time state changes, right? So. Um, you know, ultimately a vehicle moving and, and that sort of a ping, that's an event to an organization. A, a temperature change on a sensor is an event, an account being opened or closed or overdraft, these are all examples of events. So typically, I think the cleanest definition is, is when state changes, that's an event. For a, for a synchronous transaction, that's, let's say some uh, an API trigger happened online, right? And set of sequence, subsequent calls happen with the different microservices. And the business logic will be executed, and then some database access, and then you reply back with the response. In this synchronous process, do you think using events drive this sub, the, like chore a choreography model running a domain business logic is the way to go, or keep the calls synchronous all through by accessing API endpoints for synchronous response. But for offline workflows, mm -hmm. uh, so we use event-driven mechanism. We, we, how, do, how, do you, how do you see what is the right way of um, depending on APIs or events in, in a synchronous flow? 
Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I think I understand your question. Um, so I believe that, and we just actually did this last year with a big bank around the, kind of this question of, you know, if you have sort of a synchronous um, interaction style and it's sort of a chain that's kind of orchestrated or one service is calling another, um, you know, that, that is how it is today. But in a lot of cases, uh, one of our customers, which is a big telco, they were doing that over and over again as they kept expanding. And so the user response time kept getting worse and worse. And so what they started to do was say, okay, what is the minimum amount of functionality for a user experience that you have to perform synchronously? And then kicking out into what we call a deferred execution pattern to actually do things then post-processing. So to your point, try to get as much of the, you know, do the minimum, bare minimum requirement for that customer journey um, synchronously, but then do a lot of your post-processing asynchronously. Yeah, All right, so, so yep, think, we're out of time. Yeah, we're out of time, so if so. you guys have any more questions or anything, please come by the booth. We also have a raffle there, so it's all booth is. Thank right you, Jonathan. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>